dear, dear first significant group meetings I confronted was I came stumbling in the door or at least in the back of the room, I said, I'm intoxicated. <laughs> and so, literally, I guess I am near intoxicated tonight because if you look in the dictionary, I didn't have time to review the dictionary today. I had a little things out there. I think there's two or more definitions for intoxication. We have educators in here, and you not it. This from practical experience. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, one group uh, confronted this way was I'm intoxicated over your beauty, and uh, you excite me so greatly. And the other one was I'm intoxicated by these bees. <laughs> that I'm so passionate about them that all I have is bees on my brain or else I have bee brains. <laughs> so either, either definition you want to choose will, will be all right for me. I believe <coughs> Dr. Green asked me to come talk to you tonight about maximum honey production from a common bee. Is that right? Is that what all of you want to hear? Let me, let me see who my audience is here tonight. How many of you have less than five colonies of bees? Huh. Yeah, you can count the batch. That's more than the majority of the present, isn't it? So y'all win. It's already rules. How many have at least, uh, at least 25? See how you got number? <laughs> okay. How many of you, even the smallest number of colonies you have, how many of you are producing up to this point in this year over 100 pounds of colony? You, need to, you do need to hear about maximizing your hunting. <laughs> I brought at least one witness with me. <laughs> I'm reminded of this uh, professor that just got tired of giving his lecture. <laughs> he just plain got tired of it. He got invited to this, invited to that. He was just wore out toward the end of the week. And <clears throat> he said something to his chauffeur about it. He says, I just don't feel like getting up there in front of that uh, group anymore this week. How about you take it over? He said, Why, well, sure. I'd be glad to. Of course, he'd already memorized the lecture. He knew exactly what he was going to say. And it comes time for questions. <clears throat> Somebody in the back of the room wanted to ask him some kind of question. He came up with, how big is uh, something or other <laughs> somewhere in the universe? Oh, fine, great. I'm, I appreciate that question you asked. That's just a wonderful question. Brings us right to the point of this so simple a question. I'm just going to ask my chauffeur to answer that for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the chauffeur got to answer that question. <clears throat> Since then. Uh, since I do literally have a chauffeur tonight, uh, Tim, why aren't they making a hundred pounds of colony? Why aren't they making a hundred pounds of colony? Yeah. Not managing them right. That's not the right answer. I got a little. <laughs> About 35 pounds. 35 pounds. He said he's going to embarrass me. 
<laughs> yeah, I thought he was going to be the one to pick on it. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, let's just uh, jot around the room. Don't be embarrassed by it. Just tell us straight out the truth. Uh, how, how many pounds were you making for common? I, I haven't harvested honey yet. I, I can know. guess. <laughs> okay, give us your best guess. You've got an idea what's out there. About 60 or 70 on my better call. All right. Yeah, about that 50 to 60 on some, some none, so I don't know what it would average out. Yeah. yeah. Come on, come on, just volunteer. I'm not going to pick on anybody. <laughs> anybody wants to say how much they're getting or how hard I've gotten? Come I on. do packages over here, so i Your package, okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, you how much does three gallons weigh? Uh, three times 12 is 48 pounds. Okay. Uh, 48 pounds. <laughs> Forty-eight pounds, one pound. Yes. Okay. More, more, more. Three. 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 It's all right. It's all right. Well, I sort of say that a, a three-unit colony is about what you need to work with. One colony is hard to keep, hard to maintain. 25 colonies gets into the labor and work. And if you just want to do the rocking chair type beekeeping, which is perfectly all right, if that's, if that's your style, uh, get you three colonies and get you a rocking chair and, and, and go out and sit it down beside of you and, and watch it work. Do what you need to do with them when you need to do it and help them when you can help them. Do like my wife always says, find out what I want to do and help me do it. Find out what the bees want to do and help them do it. That's the way to get along with women, isn't it? <laughs> and these gals in these beehives are all ladies. They do the work especially. So, just finished up a course down at MTSU about May the 10th. And I believe the number of students in the class was about 18. 19. 19. Okay. 19 in the class. Only four men in the whole class. Well, the rest of them looked like a beehive. They were all women. Just a couple of drums. About, about, about the right ratio. About the right ratio. Uh, workers to drones. Uh, so that's what you got to have to make a maximum honey crop is a house full of women. I mean, the house has to be full. When you walk out into a bee yard and you look and you see something a little strange and you walk a little closer and you hear a little bit of a noise and you can't quite figure out what it is. Uh, but you know it's not a usual phenomenon in the bee yard or in your area, even in your, in your yard. That when you get closer to the bee colonies, you begin to sense something is a little different. And you get closer and you observe that the walls of the beehive are going <laughs> every breath. You can tell that's a full colony of bees. That wasn't a joke I've never been. <laughs> <laughs> I lost you, didn't I? I lost you. <laughs> uh, I don't have any pictures. I don't have any uh, PowerPoint. I can't uh, project anything. So stick with me. Stay with me. <laughs> um, how do you make a full colony of bees? Uh, that's the question you want to ask. How do you do it? Well, you start right now for the year honey production of 2013. You start right now. This is July the 12th, middle of the month, practically. And July is going to be a wet month, as it already started off. But you need to be out there looking and observing your bees, get your honey off if you already have bees, uh, bee colonists, uh, extract that honey, 
take your wet supers back uh, between sundown and dark and put them back on the top of the colony, let the bees clean it up overnight. I, I deplore these people that bring in and uh, you're going to tell me you do it, and I'm not going to like it a bit, let you put your supers out and, and open and let the bees clean them up. Uh, you're inviting potential problems. If you live in an area where there's American fowl brood, you've just gotten in contact with American fowl brood, it'll wipe your colonies out. You're going to have to clean up, burn up, and start all over again if you're interested in doing these. And if you <coughs> stay on top of it and let that happen, uh, you can keep bees a long time. I haven't treated, <coughs> I don't know how long it's been. I used to treat because I thought that was, a that, was, that was part of the ritual of religion. You had to treat your bees. And so folks started talking about, no, you don't have to treat your bees. Why do you treat, <coughs> why do you put medication on yourself when you're well? Do you not treat yourself when you're sick? Do not, not so much going to the doctor when you're well? So I just converted that over to my bees and I, I quit treating them. And I, it's been a goodly while since I've treated any bees for anything that wasn't necessary. Now, I have treated bees, don't get me wrong. And I'll treat them tomorrow if I find a good cause and why I ought to be doing it. But uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to let, uh, let uh, uh, the best take care of itself and uh, I used to be in the rabbit business and uh, that was another <laughs> that's another story I'm not going to linger on that but I never had a sick rabbit more than a couple of hours as soon as I found it I made arrangements for it rabbit help <laughs> 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 and so I, I, I didn't I didn't feed very many sick rabbits you get 300 rabbits out there in your backyard and and, and, and one of them gets the sniffles and sneezes and, and it spreads through you like wildfire, you soon out of the rabbit business. So sacrifice that one and, and get rid of it and go on. So you might need to think about doing that with your bees. If, uh, if you need to get rid of one, well, sacrifice it, go on. If you get American fowl, you better sacrifice it now and not later. Uh, just go ahead and burn it, clean up. Hope you haven't spread anything in, in, in previous months or weeks working at Collins and didn't know about it. But at least get that one now. If you get another one, get it now. And as soon as you see it happening, we'll, we'll just get rid of it. Burn it. That's big, big a pit, big enough to collect all the colony, bees, everything about the colony, and burn it down to ashes. Cover those ashes 18 inches under the ground and pack it down so that it doesn't look like a loose uh, uh, a grave so that animals coming by won't want to be enticed to dig it up again. Because if they dig up those ashes and the bees come around sniffing on those ashes, take that back to the beehive, they still have American fowl grave. Now I said that. If those in authority, those that say burning kills it, won't agree with me on that. But don't take the chance. Don't. Don't burn it on top of the ground and expect that you kill all the spores and 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 then uh, play play with danger. Go ahead and get rid of it completely. And <clears throat> now, if you're going to start now preparing for 2013, uh, here's a few things you're going to have to do. We're going to assume that you have healthy colony of bees, you have bees, and 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 you're going to plan to carry them over the winter and come out next spring being prepared to soup room for, for a honey crop. Number one, you need a strong, prolific laying queen. Usually, the younger queens are the stronger. Now, there's lots of exceptions to all of that that I just said. And we could dwell on it quite a while. But we're going to assume that you're going to have a strong Bible queen going from now forward, and or you have a young queen that's supposed to be viable and strong. And 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 uh, and you're going to prepare, continue to observe this colony into the fall, 
making sure from now on out that it gets no less than 15 pounds of honey on it at any time from here on out. Come late fall, in this area, I'm going to suggest that you be thinking about the last 10 days of October. If they have not brought in a fall honey crop by the, and you don't see it out there in the weeds, uh, potential nectar flow coming on, then starting the last 10 days of October, you start feeding that colony. If it has gotten less than 15 pounds between now and then, you must feed it also. Because once bees get below 15 pounds of food supply in their stores, in their colony, they're going to go into a different mode of activity. Did you hear what I said? They're not going to act the same as they will if they have 25 or 40 pounds on that colony. How do they know when it's down to 15 pounds? How do they know when it's up to 25 to 50, 40 pounds? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I can assure you that what you do and allow the bees to do, and they get into that mode, is not an immediate attack. They don't really write it out on pencil and paper. They don't do you a PowerPoint and tell you all about it. About two months from now, you'll find out because it, that, that load will continue down or down. And then in about two months, three months from now, it's going to pop its head up. You're going to say, what happened to my bees? What went wrong? What happened? So just don't let them get down low on feed, uh, food supply. And then the reason you're going to feed the last part of October is because they need time enough to process that substitute feed you're giving them into a usable food supply to carry them through the winter. If you wait till December to start feeding your bees, they don't have time to process it. They are in another mode in December than they are in October. And they're not going to be able to process that nectar, light syrup, or, or weak syrup that you're going to give them. And I, I may be using terms here that I bet should have said. You should feed them strong syrup in the fall, but it's still a, a diluted syrup. It's a diluted solution. Uh, a one-to-one -one in the springtime or right now is okay to feed because they have good flying activity. As they go into the fall and cooler nights and all, they don't have, uh, and, and what they need to process is, is over a shorter period of time in late fall before they have to have <coughs> the condition for them to consume it. So you give them a, two, uh, a one to two ratio in the, in the fall months uh, because it takes less energy, less effort for them to take the moisture out of a two to one than it does a one to one. And, and so that's, that's the game plan there. Uh, because they're going to have to take that moisture down to, to a, uh, 20% or less versus uh, uh, what, 60 40 if, uh, if you're feeding them. Two to one shirt, they're going to have a lot, a lot of moisture to take out. Still, at two to one, they're going to have a lot of moisture to take out. So, give them, give them the stronger shirt in the fall, the weaker shirt in the springtime, because of their weather conditions. Because cold weather's coming, warm weather's coming. Springtime, warm weather's coming. Fall, cold weather's coming. So, <clears throat> so get get the food on those bees so that they can put it where they want it. And don't give them too much room to put the syrup. Confine those bees down to a smaller unit going into the winter. Now how small depends on how many bees you might have in the following year. I compress my bees down to <clears throat> store 
what you're going to call a score and a half. That's a full high body and one, one super. That one super can be a shallow or it can be a medium. Now, quickly to tell you, I'm trying my best to go uniform. I'm trying my best to go to all medium supers, interchangeable Illinois supers. Uh, and that, therefore, I don't have to try to wonder, will this one here that has some kind of food on it fit over here in this box, or vice versa, and so forth. And I've done that for, since 1960, trying to find out how to manage these with uh, three different layers of, of equipment. A full high body, medium, and a shallow. Well, nothing ever fits. Never fits. I spend more time going from here to there and back to that one to try to get something to fit than I do good managing what I'll be doing. So I'm, I'm trying my best to convert. It's a slow process. I've been at it now for 10 years and I'm still, I still have a, a, a deep high bias. But I'm trying to go to all mediums and if you'll do that at your start, whichever size you want. It doesn't make any what size you want. If you want all deep, keep all deep. If you want all mediums, keep all mediums. If you want all shallows, keep all shallows. I know one of the best experts, she's been here in this state giving a, a B, B talks, was over at our, uh, here at the building out here uh, this past fall in October, uh, talking to us. She was the featured speaker. Dr. Mary Ann Frazier. Any of you out there have heard her? Yeah. Okay. You know what size of beehive she has? She has all shallows. She manages her bees in shallows. So if you ladies don't want to live so much, just put your bees in shallows. And let them go to work. Now, if I'm using uh, mediums, or if I were using shallows, I'd probably keep them down uh, on the, uh, I'd try to keep their brood nest in two shallows. That's enough. Believe it or not, that's enough for a brood nest. Now on top of that brood nest, you got to have some food. You can't just use that two shallows as the brood nest and think they got enough food there. No, that's brood nest. That's brood. There's no food there, essentially. Well, they've got a little bit. That's insignificant as far as the amount of food you need to have on. You may have to have two shallow foods as well as two shallow broods in order to allow the winter and be able to switch that food where it needs to be next spring. You don't switch it in wintertime. You let them do their thing and go into the winter the way they want to. From October on, you let them go into the winter the way they want to. You just make sure they've got 40 pounds of food on there. That's all you have to be concerned about. Make sure they've got 40 plus pounds of food. And if you've got two shallows, you've got 40 pounds of food. <coughs> Agreed? Are those eight frame or 10 frame? Well, I'm sure I'm speaking of 10 frames. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you've got an 8 frame, you're going to, you're going to have to go higher instead of wider <coughs> to, to make up all the difference. <clears throat> okay, come November the 10th, You do all the things that are necessary to winterize your colony, to reduce it down to a uh, small entrance that you put the entrance producers on. Uh, by that time, take all the surplus empty things uh, off of them. Don't leave excess empties on them any longer. Uh, give them ventilation at the top. Put the outer cover on them. Buy your cruise ticket. <laughs> I you. And go to the loop. Remember, my wife calls you, he told me that. <laughs> uh, my mentor used to tell, tell, that, tell it that way. He'd say, go to Florida. 
I'd rather go anywhere and <laughs> go to Florida. I just, I've been to Florida two times too many. <clears throat> but uh, that's uh, <clears throat> that's it until come spring. You don't need to look at your bees. Oh, your curiosity better get the best out of you. You better go out and see if the uh, bears turn them over or see if the skunk is eating them up. Or just, you just ought to see them. You, know, you ought to go by and look at them. Say, I see you're still here and, uh, and go on about your business. But if you go to If you go to Croatia, you won't be back in time to check on the varmints. You better prepare them for the varmints before you go. Uh, Croatia's a lot better place to go than Florida. <laughs> Not a lot better type of vacation scenes. Uh, they say, they have a saying, one step to the sea and two steps to the mountain. So, they, they, they have a, a tremendous variety. Highest point in Florida is 400 feet in elevation. April, would you recommend reclaiming? If the uh, I told them to have those good queens in now. So anytime from now, if you need to replace the queen that you have there. She hadn't done any good, or she's getting too old, or she was the best producing colony you had this year. You need to requeen her by the, between now and at the end of August. I'll give you six weeks to get the job done. If, you, if your colony has produced 150 pounds, that's the best queen you've ever seen or heard of. You've got the strongest population of bees. You know what's happened to her? Wore out. She's done done her duty. None of us have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe you just better back up and start with a good queen now. <laughs> Doesn't sound like you've got the best queen. <laughs> oh, man. Well, where do you get those queens? Oh. Backwood Atries, P.O. Box 303. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, Chevyville, Tennessee, 37162. Phone number 931-684-0826. So when do you answer the phone? <laughs> I sure don't have a, an answering service and I don't have a, a recorder and I don't have ID and, and I have to climb the pole when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> do you use uh, queen excluders in your hives? Yes, sir. Do you, which one's uh, metal or plastic? Metal. Metal. Have you ever noticed uh, that sometimes the bees don't seem to want to go past that point? Well, sure. It's a restriction. Oh, I know, but okay. I don't, don't want to go. They don't want to go past that. What so, do you do? What do you do? Yeah. You want them to go above the excluder? Don't put it on. <laughs> you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can tease bees a little bit. Uh -huh. you, you can tease them some. What you do is you take a frame of brood, or two frames, and put it near the middle of the colony, above the queen excluder. You may put those two together or you may put something in between them. If it's a time of year that you need to do it, you need foundation built, you put a foundation right between those two bridges. One sheet, of course. 
put one frame of foundation right between those two roots, and then of course you got to fill out the rest of it. Otherwise, they're going to do something in that empty cavity there. So tease them up. Sometimes you can do that with a honey frame. You can put a honey frame above the queen excluder. And if I was going to do that, I'd put a honey frame on the two outside walls. Two outside frames would be honey. Everything in between is either foundation or drawn cone. Preferably drawn cone. Then, of course, if you put two frames of brood up there, what do you got to do? You got to go back in time to cut down any queen cell they may have raised above that, but not likely will they raise a queen cell on brood just above the queen excluder, provided there's connecting brood just under the queen excluder. Now, if you've got a space there, there's no brood, and you put a brood up, look out, they're going to build queen cells on. Okay. Hmm. And you have ten, less than 10 days to get back to that brood and cut down the queen cells on it. Could you do that if you just need to build another hive? Another hatch out? <coughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure. Anytime <coughs> you got two queens in a colony, you can flip one off and move it over, provided you want to feed them. Now if it's nectar flow time, bring it in nectar, you don't need to plan on feeding as drastically as you will if it's uh, this time of year and there's no nectar coming in, you split one off, you better have your feed bag ready. So it depends on when you're doing it, what the circumstances are, weather, 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 weather will have a big influence on it. Uh, I, I condition my sale of my queens, weather permitting. Weather permitting. So, weather is a big factor, a big influence on bees and how they work and react and <coughs> what, uh, what's going to be uh, the results of what they can do. They, if the weather conditions are such, they may not make it 30 pounds of coffee. <laughs> and if the weather conditions are, are likewise in reverse and the nectar flow is out there and the bee population is in the colony, they're going to bring that nectar in. The biggest thing you've got to be concerned about and, and know about is what are these conditions and how are they affecting the colony. And if you've got a big population of bees <coughs> and they've already gotten congested, you're going, to be, you're going to have to be prepared to start cutting queen cells down and keep them down. Or otherwise, What's going to happen? Half your colony went out yonder and beyond the point where you can do any managing of them and therefore went what? Honey production. Your honey crop. Absolutely. So keep your bees at home next spring if you want to make a maximum honey crop. But we are sort of getting there well, go. <laughs> so we've gotten back from our vacation in uh, Cancun, and uh, <clears throat> and so uh, it's uh, February the fifteenth, and we need to look to see how much food is on that colony. Food is going to be your first first observation in the spring. And bee population. Are they looking like there's a good number of bees there? Or does it look like it's a little handful? And is there sufficient food? And where in the colony is the food? If the bees are hovering over here in this corner, and the food is over here in this corner, and there's a lot of empty space between these bees and that food. What can you expect? Dead bees. Dead bees quickly. If you open them up February the 15th and still have live bees and food at the opposite end, you better do something quick. What are you going to do? Combine them. 
move the honey over the food and stuff over to make sure the bees are all right? Absolutely. You're going to have to get some food to the bees. You can't move the bees to the food. You've got to move the food to the bees. Leave the bees alone. Somehow, some way, get that food to them. Now, February the 15th, it's not spring yet, is it? You're going to have a cold night. So pouring sugar syrup on top of these bees is not the best way to feed them. You're going to kill them. You're out to kill them. That food will drip, drip a little bit down. Won't be much, but it's moisture. It's moisture. It may not drown them, but there's moisture there. That moisture will get cold, and if droplets fall down, that's cold, and you have just frozen or chilled or killed your bees. So move some food to them. If you're going to move a frame of, say you're going to reverse one of the frames and put it to the side of these bees, or you're going to shift the frames so that you can get food on both sides of the bees, quick way to feed them if you have that condition is to scratch the honey cappings. Scratch the honey cappings. Put that scratched portion of that honey right next to the bees on both sides of them, preferably, and you have just fed them wonderfully. Made it easy for them. Now, leave them alone two weeks. <coughs> you, you fed them up, small group of bees there, leave them alone two weeks. Go back and see what they're doing. Observe what the weather has been during that two weeks. So you're going to have to become a weatherman, an insect person, a botanist, a biologist, a carpenter, a plumber, a honey taster, and a travel agent, all in one, in order to be a good beekeeper. Now that you've observed these bees that way for another two weeks, <clears throat> you've just finished out the month of February, haven't you? <coughs> now you've got a strong colony of bees, lots of bees in there. How are you going to manage that colony? Well, I'm going to give you a scenario. <coughs> you've got a colony that's well populated in bees. At least three pound size, thirty thousand bees or so. There's no food in the bottom brood area, regardless of what size box you got. I'm not talking about boxes. I'm not going to talk about brood area, okay? Regardless of, so we're in the brood area, which is the lowest point down to the bottom board, they have consumed every smidge of that throughout the winter, and it is dry as a bone. There is no food in that bottom unit whatsoever. Where are the bees? The top. The top. They're pushing the inner cover off your hive. They're trying to go out the top by pushing the inner cover off. Well, of course, they can't do that. So there they are. They're jammed up to the, to the ceiling and can't go any further. And they're not going to go back down to get food. If it did, there's none down there. Let's suppose there is some food. The scenario that I'm going to plant for you is there is food in that top unit and there's bees up there. They can't go any further because you got the inner cover on them, you got the top on them. What you do is you take that group of bees with whatever amount of food is in there and you reverse everything in that colony. The bottom unit is on the bottom now. It's empty. You're going to bring it up 
and eventually put it on the top. The middle one, if you had a three layer, three tier unit, you're going to take that middle one and put it where? Number two unit, which is right above. It. Okay, let's do some imagination. I'm going to start this over again real slow. Listen fast. <clears throat> Number one is empty, number two is in the middle, number three is on the top. Inner cover and the cup, outer cover. That's what you got. Take number one, set it off to the side. Take number three, put it on the bottom. Take number two, put it on top. Second, take number one that you set aside, put it right at the very top. Put your inner cover on, your outer cover, and you've got three, two, one. Inner cover and top. Follow me? Right. What did you just do when you did that? Give some place to go. Get more room quickly. What else? Put the bees on the bottom. Put the bees on the bottom. That means they've got room to go up because the empty is above them. And it's their nature to work up. Remember that. It's the nature of bees to work upward, not outward. Deplorable, deplorable situation is these people, hope some of you are in here, <laughs> that are sold on top bar high. Bless you. More power to you. <coughs> Don't make any honey, but you sure will have fun doing it. <coughs> you just reverted back about 500 years of beekeeping or longer. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Where was it? You just reversed out of place. Okay. And I want to know what you did. You gave them room. <coughs> These are on the bottom. You gave them room for them to move up because it's their nature to go up, not outward. Now, what else did you do? Gave the queen room to lay. Well, yeah, that's that's part of the moving up. Yeah. What else? Prevented swarming for one thing. How? Pardon? How? By giving them more room to go up, they they can spread out a little more and <coughs> not feel so crowded. They can store honey overhead. Nectar, you can come nectar. Over here. You sure did tend to reduce swarming because of what? You gave them an extra room to go up, mm -hmm. and if you don't reverse them, and they sit up here, and they feel congested, and they feel tight, they won't go down, that's the best way in the world to create a swarm cell, a uh, building swarm cells for that natural phenomenon that bees do on their own, just like cows have calves, cats have dogs, and dogs have kittens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it's their nature to swarm because they are in uh, they are they're the insect that has to do that in order to increase their population, their family. Their family growth is by swarming. A bee that won't swarm is not a honey bee. <coughs> And we want to keep them from swarming all the time. We want to, just told you a while ago, keep your bees at home, don't let them swarm, make a maximum honey crop. You're going against nature. You're going against the whole scheme of their, <coughs> the way they live. The way they've been brought up for millenniums of years. That's the way they do it. And you can't stop it. You're not going to stop it. Totally. But you sure can assist them, find out what they want to do and help them do it. If they want to swarm, just leave them up there and help them swarm. If you, if you move them down, it's their nature to work up, they want more room, they entice, they're happy to have more room, and when they have more room, they want to occupy it. If they got a big house, they want to fill it up. So they'll fill up this uh, space with more bees and if there's a little nectar out there, like off of willows and uh, elder, uh, uh, elders and uh, those uh, 
little things that bloom on the, on the low growing ground that almost have to go under the leaf to find the blossom. They'll find it and they'll bring in nectar so early or pollen so early. How many of you have seen bees bringing pollen in in January? <laughs> this year? Yes, yes sir. Maple. Yes, sir. Not necessarily off of maple. I believe they go under the leaves on the ground and the woods. They go under the leaves and find those blossoms blooming under those leaves and bring nectar and pollen in. Especially pollen, especially pollen. Not so much nectar on those kinds of little plants, but those little plants with the little blossoms you can't even see. The bees go out there and get pollen off of it bring it into January. There are no big trees out there blooming in January, are there? No. I'm kidding about them going under the leaves, but they sure do. These little plants do grow mighty low to the ground. What's that little plant that's so pretty in the in a very cold month of the year. Crocus. And something else too. There's another one. Snowdrops. Snowdrops. A little bit of bluish type blossoms. At any rate, anyway, you know there are several of those. You know there's a bunch of them out there. That there's some heathers and stuff that grow like that push through the small so Yeah, yeah. Very early spring. <clears throat> when are bees supposed to fly? Temperature wise, temperature wise. When are, when are bees supposed to fly? As the books say, uh, when, when bees start working out of their hive and flying out to gather their first. What's the temperature? 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 45 to 50. And he said 50, 55. You're down to 45. Anybody in here read the, read the books, books that tell us what it is? My book says 55, but I saw them out at 50. Your book says 55. Well, we got some bees. There you go. Oh, I need to kill <laughs> We got bees, believe it or not. We got we got bees down in our tree that would fly on a calm, sunny day, forty-three degrees, and calculated and measured. Thermometers didn't put at high. Forty-three degrees. Now, if the wind is blowing and it's overcast and all that kind of thing, they may not do it. How many of you have heard of the Mahoney plant or know about the shrub Mahoney? Never heard of Mahoney? It's a very thorny type growing plant, but it has a nice blossom on it. That will attract bees in February. What is it again? Mahoney. Don't spell honey, spell M. Honey is with an H. Mahoney is with an M. Mm -hmm. So, sidekick here. <coughs> Not necessarily an advertisement, but a bit of information. I have collected those bees and I have propagated them. And I have offspring of those bees now. You don't want me to tell you a real fish story, don't you? <laughs> <coughs> they are, have not proven to this point to be the best honey producer. We're still working with them. We're still working on them. We're still giving them a slap on the bottom to try to push them on out there to get some, something, something in there in their genes to say you need to be gathering honey, not flying. Just to be flying, you need to be gathering honey and bringing that nectar in to, to, to fill up that hive. So while I'm on that subject, let me just tell you, I mentioned the cavity there a while ago. 
this will come a little later in your activity of, of bee management throughout the season. But you, you need to be thinking about it right now. That is to have plenty of room to put on your bees when it comes time to get them to build more bees by putting them on the bottom and letting them have that empty space that's already existing. You need to have additional empty space to put on them later on when they fill up these two empties that are on them through the winter or that they created empty during the winter uh, as they come out. Now, uh, you're not going to need that until the nectar flow begins to come in pretty strong. And when I say it's coming in, this, well, I went to several meetings and I told them when the honey flow was going to start. May 1, 2012. Well, by May 1, the honey flow was almost over. <laughs> <laughs> there was no honey made in my area from the 10th of June till today. Not a drop. Not a bit. With one, with one exception, and that's a, a rare exception. But nevertheless, even sourwood did not even produce this year. And we normally think we ought to have a bee in sourwood right now. My knowledge up to this point, unless you got something up above 4,000 elevation or 3,500 elevation in the Smoky Mountains, can you expect to get the sourwood honey? Sourwood grows around here in Monterey and somewhere up in here and down on the Cumberland Plateau toward Mont Eagle, Swanee, down in that area. Now, there's always exceptions. Do any, any of you know where Arnold Engineering Air Force Base is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it on the mountain? Mm -hmm. It's down in the flat, isn't it? Absolutely down in the flat. Sourwood growing right along the base, right along the Arnold Engineering Center. Sourwood trees. Now, Further on over, outside of Tullahoma, at a place called Motlo, there's a little ridge that runs from Jack Daniels Distillery right across the Motlo campus that extends on a little ridge called, if I'm not mistaken, it's called Pea Ridge. I'm not sure of that. The little ridge runs out just uh, uh, above Normandy little community out there called Normandy. Go a little bit, go, go a couple thousand feet further past Normandy and, and, and you can jump into Normandy Lake. <laughs> but at any rate, from Normandy, top of the hill at Normandy on that little ridge, there's a, there's a strip of sourwood growing all the way across Mont, um, uh, Motlow Community College over to Jack Daniels Distillery. And it produces sourwood honey. And uh, <clears throat> no sourwood honey produced this year. No sourwood honey produced in Swanee area, on Eagle Mountain. I understand there is some sourwood being produced up in the high elevations in the Smoky Mountains. But outside of that, there has been no honey produced in Middle Tennessee area, to my knowledge, since around June 10th or a few days <coughs> before that. But June 10th on, Zilts, nothing. What have bees been doing? Turn it into bees. It takes one cell of food to produce one bee. One cell of food to produce one bee. Do I use queen excluders? Yes. Near the end of the honey flow, normal years is June 15th. I put my queen excluders on. You're supposed to go back and check those queen excluders to see how much brood you got above or below and to see if you've got the queen below or above. If you've got her above, you better be putting her down because if you don't, she's going to eat up another honey super quick. You will lose a honey super of honey quicker above a queen excluder than you can ever imagine any other way. They will consume that honey faster there than any place else that I have ever seen. So if you want to lose a honey crop, put your queen excluders on and leave the queen above the queen excluders. <laughs> and you don't have to go back and harvest your honey. 
<laughs> it is already harvested. <clears throat> we just get we just went through a full blown scale demonstration of that principle at the MTSU. We lost two good supers of honey because we have two queens in each top. One below, one above. Mm. One below, one above. <laughs> and, and what did we do when we tried to take off that super of honey that we were going to take off above the queen excluder? It wasn't there. It was already gone. So, instead of us making 120 pounds to the colony average, we only made 100 pounds average. We lost two good supers quick. But we got two queens, and we got two queens. Well, now we got four instead of one. I mean, two. Four and two. Four instead of two. Yeah. By way of queens. Now, do we want to keep all those queens? Quick evaluation. Quick management decision. Decision, decision. Time has come. Do we want to keep both those queens? <coughs> Yeah, I think we made the decision on the way up here. We're going to open up the food bag and we're going to keep both of those queens. We're going to increase by two more colonies. More honey. Next year, not this year. We're going to feed now and get them through the rest of the summer. We're going to make sure they have food on them going into the winter by 1st of November. Close them up. Go back and look at them February the 15th see what we got. So when you split those hives, do you supply the split with 15 pounds of honey right off the bat? Yes sir, or more. Or yes sir, or more. If you don't, it don't take them long to figure out that they don't have the amount of food on there that they need to continue their existence. They just have that quick intelligence to determine we don't have the food. We're going to do this, or we're going to do that. And I believe those bees just talk to one another real quick, and they say, we get down to a small amount of food, we're going to have to start looking for new homes. Have any of you ever found a, colony, uh, a swarm of bees hanging on the outside of your colony uh, in August? You know what that is? That's a starvation desertion swarm. It left somewhere where it was starving.